Hey, we're glad you're here today on this beautiful summer Palm Sunday morning. What an awesome day. Would you stand? Psalm 118 says, you are my God, I will give you thanks. You are my God, I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Father, we're here gathered as your people. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Lord, open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise this morning. Thank you, Lord.
how great thou art, how great thou art. Oh, and God's people said, amen. You may be seated for just a moment. I'm going to invite some families to come and join me up here. We have some special little ones who are being dedicated to the Lord this morning. So families, friends, come on up. Come on up. Jennifer, come on up, folks. Pastor Faith is going to help us today. Come on in, Harry. That's great. Thanks, families. Thanks, friends. <laughs> Well, this is wonderful. Um, families, you know that you've been given a really special gift from God, uh, that He has blessed you with these special kids um, to be able to love and to bless and to pray for and to lead into the knowledge of the Lord. So moms and dads, if you guys will commit yourself to not only love these little ones, but to pray for them, to lead them into the knowledge of the Lord, say, we will. We will. Wonderful. Uh, family and friends, you're here too because they know they need your help and need you to be an encouragement and blessing. So if you will commit yourself to do that, to love them and pray for them and to be the support they need, say, we will. We will. will. Wonderful. What is we will? We will. We will. will. Amen. (laughs) And they did this not privately, but here with you because they need the body of Christ. We need the body of Christ to to love and to cherish these little ones that God has given to us and to be the kind of church they need, uh, to be the kind of moms and dads, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters in Christ that they will need uh, to love and to nurture, the kind of folks who will bring candy to extravaganza next Saturday, (laughs) but who will pray and teach and love. If you will commit yourself to do that, if you will be the body of Christ for these little ones, say, we will. will. Wonderful, wonderful. Let's start with Alyssa. Alyssa, you think she'll let me hold her? Come here, sweetie. Come here. Be careful. I will be careful. I have been instructed by the sister today. How beautiful. What a blessing. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for this lovely family. We thank you for Alyssa and for the gift of her life to this family and to us as a church. But most importantly, we thank you today for her life and what it will mean for your kingdom. And so we come and we invite your spirit to bless her and to guide her. May you surround her not just with your care and protection, but but may you guide each step of her life. May she at the very earliest possible age come to know you in all your fullness and may she serve you all the days of her life. And so we come and we dedicate Alyssa Headcock to you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, are you like this all the time? Oh, bless you. Congratulations, you guys. Blessings. Olivia, congratulations. Thanks for taking good care of your sister. Congratulations, everybody. Congratulations. Thank you. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. All right. Let's do Ariana. Come here, sweetie. Ariana, how old are you? Six. Six. Oh, that's so wonderful. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today for Ariana. We thank you for her life. We thank you for your love for her, and we thank you for all that she is learning about your love and the direction you have for her life. We pray, God, that you would guide each and every step of her life. We pray that she would know you and that this place would always be home and be a place of your love and peace. And so guide her and direct her. Bless her steps. Bless this family. And we come and dedicate Ariana Medal to you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sweetie. Aaliyah, do you think you'll let me hold you? I have a feeling that's probably not going to happen, so let's just do this. (laughs) Can you see her? God, again, we thank you for this family, for their love for you, 
We thank you for these two precious girls that you've given to them, and we pray, God, that you would guide and direct. We pray this morning for Aaliyah that that you would let her know how much you love her, that you would surround her with your presence and protection, and you would guide each and every step of her life. And so we come this morning and dedicate her Aaliyah medal to you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Blessings, you guys. Congratulations. Blessings. All right, Chloe. How are you, sweetie? Chloe, how old are you? Seven. Seven. Oh, seven's such a great age. Can I pray for you? Yeah, thanks. Let's pray together. God, I thank you today for Chloe. I thank you for her life. I thank you for her family and for their love for you. I pray, God, that Chloe would would continue to walk in ways that just know how much you love her and what great plans you have for her future, the kinds of things you'd like to do in and through her life. And so, God, we pray that you would protect and guide her. We pray that she would walk with you and that her life would glorify you in amazing and lovely and beautiful ways. And so lead her. Help us to be the church that she needs. And we come this morning and dedicate Chloe Philbeck to you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Blessings to you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to greet them and thank them this morning? We will. We will. And I know you'd like to greet them. I know you'd like to greet each other. So let's stand together this morning. Pass the peace of Christ to someone this morning. Hug them, shake their hand, tell them how glad you are that they're here. That's a whole lot of friendliness out there. That's, that's a good thing. We're going to sing Hosanna as we worship the king, as our kids come forward and bring palm branches. Let's sing together. Let's lift it up.
saved us to show his love. He saved us to show his glory and his love. Sing with us. He saved us to show his glory. He saved us to show his love. He saved us to show his glory and his love. Sing with us, church. He saved us to show his glory. Saved us to show his love. Saved us to show his glory and his love. Saved us to show his glory. Saved us to show his love. Saved us to show his glory and his love. Thank you, Sun Seekers. Would you stand? you to join as our students lead in the response of reading this morning. We have placed at the foot of the cross today the palm branches that greeted Jesus as he rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. With loud shouts of Hosanna, the people in Jerusalem expected to be saved by a conquering hero. Palm Sunday reminds us of our unholy expectations. Holy Week, Holy Week reminds us that although we worshiped you on Sunday, we denied you on Friday. Like Peter, we promised that we would die for you, yet you have died for us. Help us to say no to worship without sacrifice. Help us to say yes to the cross. Palm Sunday is about politics. The entry of Christ into Jerusalem is a political parade that celebrates Jesus as King of Kings and Lords of Lords. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ Holy, Holy Week, Week reminds, reminds us that, that the, the heroes, heroes we are most likely to be like 
riding chariots, chariots pulled by white horses. We confess that we don't know how to follow a leader who emptied himself and rode on a donkey. Help us to say no to our politics of might making right. Help us to say yes to the cross. Palm Sunday is about power. We follow Jesus into Jerusalem, hoping that we might sit at his right and at his left when he comes into his kingdom. Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Holy, Holy Week reminds, reminds us, us that it is not our nature to accept the, the cup of suffering, of suffering that you drink. We, we want, want the kingdom, kingdom to come, come but, but we, we fear it, it may cost us too, too much. Help, Help us to say no to our weak obedience. obedience. Help, Help us to say yes to the, the cross. cross. Almighty God, we confess that we love parades of power. Your parade was humble. We confess that we worship conquering heroes. You were conquered. Our power cannot save us. Only your stripes can heal us. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We all have turned to our own way, but you still have shown us mercy. Teach us to be merciful to one another. Burn our palm branches into ash and help us to take up our cross daily and follow you. Amen. Atoning sacrifice, keeper of this life, hallelujah, you are Savior, beginning and the end, forgiver of my sin, by your mercy. You are stronger, more than any other. Hallelujah, Lord of Savior. Jesus, you are higher, my soul's deepest desire. Hallelujah, you are Savior. You are the service this morning with the time of open altar prayer, but in this moment, I, I would love to pray with you and, and especially just pray together for those who are in need uh, in the body. If you ever get a chance to go to Jerusalem, go and stand at the south gates of the temple and look down the mountain towards the city of David and and picture as, as the people would have on, on Palm Sunday, as they would process up 
to Jerusalem for the Passover and, and sing the psalms along the way. There are a number of psalms called the Psalms of Ascent, the psalms that the people sang as they ascended the hill to the temple. Probably my favorite, though, is the 121st Psalm. When you stand there on the south side of the Temple Mount and you look down, you see that there are hills all around. And One of the songs the people would sing goes this, this way. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? It's a wonderful question. Does our help come from all those temples built up there on those hills where other people run for their, their help? The response of the people is no. Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we lift up our eyes to the mountains, to the places where people find their help. But where does our help come from today? Our help comes from you, the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You will not let our foot slip. You won't sleep or slumber. You are our protector who never sleeps or rests. You are our protector, the shade at our side. You make us this promise, the sun won't strike you during the day, neither the moon by night. For you will protect us from all evil. You protect us on our journeys, our, our going out and our coming in from this time on and forevermore. Father, we, as, as we come into your presence today, we, we recognize our need for you today. We recognize that you have invited and called us here. It isn't about you today. It, is, it isn't about us today. It is about you. And because you're here, we know that you care and you, you care about the needs of our bodies. So we lift to you today, Margie and Bill and Chris, as they face surgery this week. We pray for Lilas and Boone and Jean and Charlene and Cindy and Lou. Not able to be with us today, um, but may they know less than we here sense your presence with them. Touch them, give them healing. Be with so many battling cancer, Charlene and Rosemary and Paula and John, Linda, Kathy, Daryl. Give strength to Roger and to Richard and to Evelyn today. In our own household, we pray, God, that you'd give the doctors wisdom with Jonah tomorrow. Thanks for your grace. Thanks for your presence. Receive our praises today, our hosannas from glad and thankful hearts. And we invite you to speak to us today as well. And so shape us by the power and the word of your spirit. For we pray this in your son's name. Amen.
Thank you. Well, it's good to be together in the house of the Lord, especially on this day to not only celebrate Palm Sunday, but to celebrate how fun it is to be an intergenerational church. And so thanks kids and young people and everybody who've been participants in the service today. It's been a blessing. The ushers are coming by with notebooks for each of the rows. We'd love to know that you're with us, especially if you're a guest today. Welcome. Thanks for worshiping with us. This is a great week for us. Uh, we got it started yesterday. Thanks for many of you who helped us at our Valley Center campus uh, have extravaganza yesterday. Uh, we will have extravaganza this Saturday on this campus. We'll have lots and lots of folks here. If you've never been a part of that, you need to show up just to witness the chaos. Um, but we also need you to bring some candy, um, the kind that doesn't melt in the sun preferably. Um, but we would love uh, for you to come and, and participate, invite families that you know. It's a wonderful event. Uh, but this week is full of, of uh, significant services and, and would just in, invite you and encourage you. Next Sunday will be so much more profound if, if you lean into the other things that are going on this week. Um, I would encourage you to spend time during this Holy Week with the Lord. Uh, but those of you who'd like to come Wednesday night, um, we're, this is our ninth time, Scott and I, to be invited to L.A. Grace uh, to, to preach as part of the seven last words of Jesus service. Some of you know that there is a, a number of African-American churches that gather together on that night, and there are seven of us who will preach the seven last words of Jesus. Scott sings, and the place goes berserk. You can't miss that part of it. Um, I... I'm not going to tell you you will be awake on Thursday morning because it's the fastest three-hour service you'll ever be a part of, but that's Wednesday night. Thursday night would encourage you to be here. Um, we're going to try a little bit of an experiment. We're going to have our Monday Thursday service in Gilmore Hall. Monday is a Latin word that means commandment, um, and we'll gather together around the Lord's table, celebrate the new commandment that he gives us to love one another and commemorate that last supper that Jesus had with his disciples. In here on Friday night, one of my favorite services of the year are tenebrae, another Latin term meaning shadows. Uh, we'll have a service, the, the choir will help us, um, but we will, through candlelight, tell the story of God's revelation, but then we will also tell the story of Holy Week. And, and we will end Friday night in silence and in darkness and, and get ready then to come back Sunday morning uh, to celebrate that Sin doesn't get the last word, and death doesn't get the last word. I, I don't want to ruin the week for you, but come back next week, and we'll find out how grace and his new creation gets the last word. I, I would invite you especially to come if you're an early bird, which usually most the people at 1030 are not, but if you would like to try it for a week. Um, we have our early morning sunrise service. Uh, we have a garden tomb out in the parking lot. We'll gather together. People in Southern California have no excuse not to come. Um, I, I was in Portland for the last few days, and when I landed in Portland on Thursday, it was foggy and cold and misty, and it reminded me of all of the sunrise services growing up in Seattle where we were gathered under the, uh, under the portico, um, freezing under blankets and trying, to, you know, saying, my dad saying, he is risen, and we'd say, he's risen indeed. You know, it was, uh, it was not the most precious of moments, but... The sun will be out, I'm sure, next Sunday, and so I'd love to have you be part of that. We'll have two services, and I especially encourage you to, to hang around um, or to show up a little bit early and be part of the baptism, celebrate our baptism services uh, next week at, at 9.30, uh, or yeah, at 9.30. Uh, what a great day to put to death that old life, and a number of people will be celebrating that. would love for you to come and just cheer the new life that they're receiving in Christ Jesus. Father, thanks for the way that you invite us to participate in your mission uh, including the way that we give. We give today as a reminder that everything that we have comes from you. We recognize that in this strange world that we live in, we give in a lot of different ways. That stuff we call cash, that those things we call checks, strange kind of cyber giving. <laughs> and yet we recognize that it's all an act of worship. It's all an act of of giving back to you in the ways that you've given to us. So bless this offering this morning. Multiply it for the purposes of your kingdom, we pray. For we pray in your son's name. Amen. I want to introduce Berkeley Braun, who's going to introduce the song that the student worship is sharing with us for offertory. All of our sins, through his crucifixion on the cross, and how we can always look to him in times of need, since he's always there for us, understands us, and loves us. Thank you, Berkeley.
Thanks. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Turn with me this morning to uh, the book of Isaiah, uh, about in the middle of the scripture, Isaiah. I want to look this morning at the 50th chapter, the Old Testament text for today begins at Isaiah 50, verse 4. As you turn there, I, I've told you a story uh, several times. I, I think of it every Palm Sunday. This is one of my favorite Sundays of the year where we celebrate, on the one hand, that we sort of get it. We, we sing Hosanna. We proclaim Christ Lord. And yet it kicks us off into this week where we realize how much we don't really get it. Um, Palm Sunday is, is much like that moment where Jesus says to Peter, but who do you say that I am? And Peter gets the right answer, that you are the Messiah. But then Jesus begins to talk about what that means, and Peter begins to rebuke him. He, he gets it, but he, he doesn't get it. it it's why, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if you'll remember this, but we will save these palm branches for a year now and let them dry out. And next year when we do this again, when we start Lent all over again, we'll will crush them and burn them and use them as the basis of the ash for us to repent, that we, we still don't fully understand what the implications of the kingdom are. And I've told you the story, but the reason I was thinking about it again, I was going through old pictures the other day. It was Noah's birthday, and so I was in this drawer that was just full of random old pictures and posting a few online. But I found this picture. I, I think, Casey, I think the guys have it. Um, but it's one of my, it's a, one of my favorite pictures that I found um, that reminds me of this story. That's us, by the way, if you can't recognize Deb and me. Um, that's Deb and me and Caleb when, when he was, what, babe, probably three, two or three. Um, that had to be about 1995 or six, about the time we were getting ready to leave. Uh, we had a dog. I don't know why we got that particular dog. Uh, I think she is in heaven now. But we... Um, but, but that picture was taken at the Rose Parade. We used to live uh, right down here on Daisy, and so we would walk onto Sierra Madre Boulevard right here and watch the end of the parade. In fact, I think that picture actually made uh, the Pasadena Star News because uh, it's such a cute family. Uh, but, <laughs> but that picture always reminds me of this story. This was right before we ended up uh, moving to Oklahoma. And so this was the last time we saw the Rose Parade before we moved to Oklahoma. And we, we got to Oklahoma in the, in the summer, towards the late summer. And when the fall happened, we were living uh, near campus and, and on campus. And, and the, it was time for the homecoming parade uh, at Southern Nazarene University. And so we told Caleb, Caleb, um, it's time for the parade. We're, we're going to go out. We're going to watch the, the SNU parade. And so we got our, our lawn chairs and we went out and we were sitting out there. And first of all, Caleb knew something was up because we were the only people out there sitting there waiting for the parade to come. But, but eventually the SNU homecoming parade came by, which consisted of a convertible with the president and his wife and the homecoming king and queen that went by, a fire truck that the Bethany <laughs> Fire Department had, had donated for the day. And then four pickup trucks, the seniors, the juniors, the sophomores, and the freshmen who had decorated a pickup truck with crepe paper and thrown a few kids in the back throwing candy at us. And so the parade lasted all of about 93 seconds, right, as it went by. So it was so funny <laughs> to have this parade go by. But I just will never forget the look in Caleb's face after the parade, you know, that was it, you know, or done, you know, I would go back and he, and he had this look like that was the parade. And I'll never forget, I looked at him and said, Caleb bless your heart, in your little life, you've now seen the world's greatest parade and the world's worst parade. <laughs> Those are the two extremes. Um, but today we, we celebrate this parade that we have entered into, where Christ is Lord. And, and even though it's the greatest parade, because the word has been made flesh and dwells among us, in some ways it's also... <laughs> the least expected parade, at least. The parade of the one who leads not with chariot and horses, but leads on a donkey. The, the irony of Palm Sunday is, is important for us. And it's what I want to reflect on again with you a little bit this morning, out of what's called the, servant, the suffering servant songs in Isaiah. There are four in the center section of Isaiah. The center section of Isaiah goes from Isaiah 40 to 55. And there are four servant songs. Uh, the first is in chapter 42, if you want to read that sometime this week. The second one is in chapter 49, right before this one. 
The short one we'll look at in a moment in chapter 50. And then the one that actually is hanging in front of you in all of these banners. Uh, the servant song may be the most well-known one at the end of chapter 52 of Isaiah into chapter 53. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The banner that will hang here next week will say, and by his stripes we are healed. But I want to look at the third one together this morning, chapter 50, beginning at verse 4. I need my glasses. <laughs> the Lord God gave me an educated tongue to know how to respond to the weary with the word that will awaken them in the morning. God awakens my ear in the morning to listen as educated people do. The Lord God opened my ear. I didn't rebel. I didn't turn my back. Instead, I gave my body to attackers and my cheeks to beard pluckers. I didn't hide my face from insults and spitting. The Lord God will help me. Therefore, I haven't been insulted. Therefore, I set my face like flint and knew I wouldn't be ashamed. The one who will declare me innocent is near. Who will argue with me? Let's stand up together. Who will bring judgment against me? Let him approach me. Look, the Lord God will help me. Who will condemn me? This morning as we, we think about this text, and, and in a little bit we'll go to Philippians chapter 2 as well, I want to think this morning about this question, and, and it's a, a little bit of a scholarly question. The question is, who is the servant that Isaiah celebrates? And this morning I want to talk about the, the servant of, of the Lord who sings this great song. But I want to think about them in, in kind of four different people, if you will. And so, if you're taking notes this morning, both of you, um, the, the, if you'll imagine with me sort of four people up here, let's start here with the prophet himself. So we'll start with the prophet. And then we'll think about how the prophet then transitions to the, the second person or actually group of people. We'll think about how the prophet relates to Israel as a nation, to, to the people of God, to Israel. And then certainly, we've got to think for a little bit today about how this song relates to Jesus and how Jesus becomes a, a very significant, if the significant embodiment of this text. But then fourth, I, I want to think about us, how this relates to then us today. So again, we're, we're going to talk about this in kind of four people. Are you ready? So the prophet, right? The prophet, and then Israel, and then, and then... Okay, so this will be on the test. So we're going to start with the prophet and then, right, and then we'll go to Jesus and then the church. Okay, so as we think about these four, I, I want to think about them in terms of what I'll call an identity crisis. Some of you know really well what it means to have an identity crisis. Um, I can feel one coming. Uh, I'm, I'm about to turn 49, uh, my wife keeps calling that virtually 50, and I keep saying, no, it's 49. Um, but I, I feel 50 coming, and I, I know some of you will roll your eyes at that. But, but there's something funny for me about thinking about turning 50, in part because it, and it's not quite at crisis level yet, although I, I may buy a sports car. But... Uh, But I think, as I think about 50, I, I think what, what happens for me when I'm thinking about 50 is I'm beginning to realize this. I am going to die. Uh, you were supposed to laugh there, but none of you did. Uh, I'm going to die, right? We're going to die. And, and there's something about 50 that says, and it's getting closer all the time, right? There's something about your 20s, 30s, and 40s. You kind of think you're invincible at some level. But then you get to 50 and you realize, oh, man, I am not. And so I'd better think about these years that I have left. What are the... What do I want the significance of them to be? So much of the 20s, 30s, and 40s for me has been wrapped up in being a dad or trying to get through school or trying to do various things. But then you, I, I just feel that moment coming where I, where I can sense in my heart thinking, who am I? What, what do I want this to be about? Some of you ex have experienced that for other reasons. Um, certainly people who lose a loved one suddenly have an identity crisis. What does it mean for me now, to, when I lose my father someday, what will it mean for me now to be the, the father, if you will? 
some of you who've lost a spouse kind of feel like, who am I now? Some of you lost jobs, and, and that's been so much a part of your identity, and all of a sudden you think, now who am I? I, I want to be careful because my parents will hear this later, but, but it's been interesting to watch them in retirement try to figure out, man, so much of our identity has been caught up in, in ministry and in what we've been doing. Who are we now in retirement? <laughs> Which, by the way, it only took them about two weeks to get another ministry job. And to kind of find that. But you find that, that sense of, of who are we? If you'll feel that identity issue, I think you'll begin to understand the problem that Israel or Judah was going through in this text. They were in exile in Babylon. They'd lost who they had been. So much of who they were was wrapped up with with what it meant to have a king. And, And so a king like David or Solomon, so so much of their identity was wrapped up in in, in political power and, and all of that was gone. Now, who are we now that we have a foreign king? Who are we now that Nebuchadnezzar rules us and not one of our own people? Who are we now that we don't have a temple? So much of their identity was wrapped up in, in the particular place of the temple. I, I remember a few years ago when the roof blew off of this place and, and we were wondering, you know, well, we have to meet somewhere else for a few weeks, and thankfully we were able to stay here. But, but could you imagine if like a tornado that happened in Oklahoma City happened here and it kind of wiped out the campus and we had to meet somewhere else? I know we'd still be us, but it'd be so weird to think about us, not at 1030 and not in this room. And this is just a church. Can you imagine when the temple is such a central part of your identity and it, it doesn't exist anymore? Who are we? Who are we? And so these servant songs, I am convinced, are are moments where the prophet, on Israel's behalf, the prophet begins to ask this question, who are we? What does it mean to be God's people? Has it meant to be God's people because we had kingdoms and we had armies? Does it mean to be God's people because we had a temple and we had the trappings of priesthood? What does it mean for us to be, who are we and who are we going to be? And I would, I would say to you this morning, out of this text and the other servant songs, that the answer the prophet begins to say is this. Begins to realize that this is who we are. We are a people, first of all, with a unique vocation and calling. God has called us to be a unique missionary in the world. So go back to the text for just a moment. Chapter 50, again, verse 4. The Lord God gave me an educated tongue to know how to respond to the weary with a word that will awaken them in the morning. God awakens my ear in the morning to listen as educated people do. The Lord God opened my ear. The the people of God, for the prophet, the prophet realizes he has given us a unique ear, a unique eye, a unique voice. He has made us a unique people. We have a unique calling. Somehow he has connected us to this vocation to somehow represent him in the world. So so it begins there. Whatever else God is doing in our lives, he is doing it as a representative, and he's called us to be this unique people in the world. But what does that uniqueness look like? That's what I want to get at with you this morning. What does that uniqueness look like? Let me suggest just three things. And again, both of you taking notes, you'll, you'll want to get this down. The two or three things that I would suggest are unique about the prophet's calling The first is this, the prophet's called to be the embodiment of covenant love. The embodiment of covenant love. One of the things the prophet is just fascinated with about God is how much he loves the world and how much he loves his people. Now, I know we say that stuff all the time, especially those of you who've grown up in church, we When we were little kids, we started singing about God is love, God is love. Praise him, praise him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. We've we've used that language so much. I think we oftentimes miss out on the significance of how the prophet understands God's love. As we dedicated those those babies uh, and, and children this morning, which is so much fun to do. You know, when you when you have children, and some of you know this, you have children and grandchildren, and you realize what a mess they've made out of your life. 
I, so the, the picture that you saw of Caleb, I, I remember when he was born over here at Huntington, and, and we hung on to him through that first night, and, and I held him a lot during that first night. You know, then with two, three, and four, you realize oh, we're going to have to take them home. So you give them the nurse and say, we'll pick them up on the way out. But, but that first one you hold, right? You say. But, but we held, I remember holding Caleb and, and, and thinking about how, how mysterious this is. His little nose and ears and fingers and toes. and Just the mystery and miracle of life. But I remember thinking how just instantaneously your life just is tied up with this one. And how he doesn't really realize how much of my happiness is caught up with his now. And not only how much of my happiness and joy is caught up with his happiness and joy now, but, but how much of my pain is caught up with his pain and grief. I mean, I think if we really thought that through, we wouldn't have as many kids as we've had. You know, that, 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 <laughs> that you start to realize, oh, my, my life is bound not only to this person that I've covenanted with, but now these children that we've had, our life, our life is tied together. The, the mystery of God's love for the prophet is that the God who could have created anything he wanted to, and the God who could have recreated anything he wanted to, so the God who could have said, I have had enough, squish, you know, whatever sound effect you want to use there. The God who could start over at any moment refuses, in a sense, to start over, but has bound up himself with the history of his creation. He has said, like the husband says to the wife in that covenant service, I am for better or worse, richer or poorer, sickness and health, committing to you. And she says that to him. And now, in this weird way, our happiness, our life is tied up together. God has said to us, his creation, for better, worse, richer, poorer, sickness and health, war and peace, sin and destruction, goodness and evil. I'm tied to you. And the biblical writers begin to understand this. This is why a few weeks ago when we talked about the Noah story, I think it's so important that we read the Noah story and it says, and God's heart was grieved that he had made humankind. It wasn't anger so much as it was sort of marital grief. Why did we have these kids in the first place? Because now we're tied to them. But here's what the prophet understands. The prophet understands God has covenanted himself to his creation. He cannot, will not give up on us. The same way we as parents, as much pain as our kids can cause us, we will not give up on them. In fact, Jesus will say it this way. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more right, has God covenanted himself in love? So that this, there is this covenant of love that, re, that refuses to let us go. And, and so, so it finds itself speaking words to the hurting. That, that's what the prophet means, that God has given him an ear to hear the cries of those who hurt. And a mouth to say to them, your sin, your sadness, your brokenness, your evil, your decisions, that is not the final word in who you are. Let me speak a different word for you. I, I, I gotta hurry, but, but I, I've told you before that when, when, when we had kids, um, we were in a Walmart one day. Actually, Debbie was pregnant. She was about seven, eight months pregnant. And we, were, we were in a Walmart and we heard a mother screaming at her kid. And the kid was pulling things off the shelf and the mother was saying, you are such a brat. You are a pain in my life. I, my life was so easy before you came along. You know, she's just letting this poor kid have it who's pulled things off the shelf. And I remember Debbie said to me, let's never do that. <laughs> and and we'd, we'd had just enough psychology to be dangerous, right? So in our cheap psychology, it's not that our kids haven't pulled things off the shelf, they have. But we've always tried to do this as they're pulling things off the shelf to say, Caleb, you are a good boy. <laughs> and good boys do not pull things off the shelf in Walmart, right? <laughs> Jonah, you are a genius and geniuses do their homework. Uh, <laughs> right? So... <laughs> Now, in our case, we may be lying to our kids, but God is telling us the truth, right? God is telling us the truth. No, we're not lying. 
But so much of the servant song says this. The identity that the prophet has is to go around to people who think life is over and say to them, you have not been forgotten, you are loved. You are not abandoned children. God is like a mother who could never abandon the child at his breast. You are the beloved of God. You are not the abandoned of God. This covenant love begins to be the the beginning of the identity for the prophet. You, You with me? It's a covenant love. The second one is this what I would call incarnational humility. I know know that's kind of a fancy word, but incarnational humility. A mystery starts to happen for Israel during exile. As they begin to reflect back on how they've experienced God, they begin to discover some really fascinating things. That they they tend to not encounter God in the moments where they expected to encounter God. So we kind of always expect to encounter God, like on the mountain, right? And Moses gets to meet God on the mountain, and, and there, you know, you get smoke and fire and mist and displays of power. You know, we kind of discover God in that. But as the prophets begin to think back about Israel's history, certainly they see God in those moments. But they begin to realize that they actually see God more in moments of humility. So think about the way they tell stories. It's not Ishmael, the oldest of Abraham, that gets blessed. It's Isaac, the youngest. It's not Esau, the older, the one who came out first of the twins. It's Jacob, the heel grabber, who gets blessed. It's not the first ten brothers of sons of Jacob. It's, it's Joseph that gets blessed. It's Almost every time Israel tells a story, it's about discovering God and God's uniqueness in the one that everybody overlooked, right? It's it's that moment where the prophet realizes he sees the wind and the fire, but it's, it's God who speaks in the silence where he's most clearly revealed. So that the prophet begins to think this, we, God's people, associate our powerful moments with God as kingship moments. Boy, that was, those were the good old days when David was in charge and Solomon was in charge. God was really God then. If we could just get back to that, right? And the prophet wants to say, listen, no, that was when we were idolaters. So you have to go back to last week's sermon. That's when we were making gods in our own image. But what, we, what the prophet begins to discover is is it's actually the God who reveals himself in slaves, in exiles, in people who now have no country and have no temple. It's the God who reveals himself there where we really begin to see God in all his fullness. So covenant love, incarnational humility. The third one, last one is this. That we begin to understand our vocation, our identity, in terms of sacrificial love, suffering love. So the text, go, go back. My, my favorite part of the text is verse 5, 6, 7. The Lord God opened my ear. I didn't rebel. I didn't turn my back. Instead, I gave my body to attackers. And this is my favorite line. And my cheek to beard pluckers. I didn't hide my face from insults and spitting that the prophet begins to recognize that this lost identity is recaptured in covenant love, it's recaptured in incarnational humility, but it's also recaptured in suffering love, in suffering. So the problem, as as the prophet begins to speak a new word into people's lives, is Babylon doesn't really like that. Because the new word that he speaks is this, Babylon is not God. Nebuchadnezzar's not king. Yahweh is Lord. Which doesn't really go well with Babylon. Um, So the prophet gets stripes on his back. He gets whipped for the things he proclaims. What's sadder is, is the attacks from the inside. So as the prophet begins to speak a new reality into people's lives, people who've gotten used to the way things are get, get frustrated that the prophet might speak new words of hope. 
because we just got used to the way things are. And so they pull out his beard. I've never been able to grow one, but, but I have random nose hairs every once in a while. And I know how much that hurts. So I, can't, I cannot imagine pulling out your beard. That's all you'll remember from the sermon now. It's all right. Again, I'm almost 50. Um, but here's, here's what the prophet understands. How the prophet responds to those who hate him and persecute him is part of the vocation of what it means to be God's people. So in a people who've lost what it means to be God's people, the prophet realizes this. The Lord, before I was even born, he, he put me together to be caught in this story, caught in this vocation. And here's the vocation, to love like he loves in this covenant love that refuses to give up on the world. To operate in forms of incarnational humility and to live in ways that are willing to overcome evil with good by being willing to suffer at the hands of others for the sake of love. Did you get that? Covenant love, incarnational humility, suffering presence. Now I gotta hurry and I won't repeat this four ways, but if we move to the second one, which is Israel. So Israel begins to understand their life as the, as the collective life of the prophets. So this, isn't, this is what really important this isn't something that we look at and we say, thank God Isaiah gets to do that and the rest of us can go after power. Thank goodness we have Isaiah who's sort of our exemplary prophet, but the rest of us get to pursue wealth and power and we get to kill our enemies. Woohoo! Yay! Yay for us. No. What the prophet understands is his life, Israel begins to understand, yes, that's right. We are God's servant in the world. He has given us, as his people, this collective identity. That's who we are in the world. That's the responsibility he's given us. Covenantal love, incarnational humility, suffering. That's who we are. Suffering redemption. That, that's the vocation he's given us as his people. That's where we got off track. That's why we lost our identity in the first place. We pursued other things and we forgot who God made us to be. You with me? Go to Philippians chapter 2 promise we're landing sort of Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 the epistle text for today this is a great hymn that Paul sings adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus verse 6 though he was in the form of God did not Consider being equal with God something to exploit, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and, being be and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names so that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth might bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he's wanting to say this. Listen, the prophet rediscovered his identity by discovering the vocation of covenantal love, of, of incarnational humility, and of, of suffering redemption. Israel rediscovers its identity after exile in, in covenantal love and incarnational humility and in, in suffering redemption. And now this beautiful hymn says, and here's what we have in Christ Jesus. We have the one who is the embodiment of God's love. Jesus will say, I'm the good shepherd. Most shepherds, if they lose one, they go, well, we still have 99. Spring's coming. We can, we'll have some new lambs. But no, covenantal love says if you lose one, you leave the 99 behind and you go find the one. If you have a son who has wasted his life, spent all the inheritance, you wait and you embrace them in grace when they come back. He is the embodiment of that covenantal love that says, I have not come to be served. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The embodiment of that covenantal love. The embodiment of incarnational humility. I really have to hurry, but lean in quick here. You must listen much faster than you do. 
the thing I love most about this hymn is that the hymn is not saying Christ hid himself for a little while in humility. Quickly, the example I'll use for those of kids who are here. Do you remember the movie Aladdin, kids? In Aladdin, Jasmine, the princess, decides she's had enough of the, this horrible life in the castle. So she goes and, and puts on the cloaks of a peasant and hangs out in the marketplace and meets Aladdin there. But as she and Aladdin are fleeing, her, her robes kind of flutter and Aladdin is able to see, oh, she's really the princess. She's just the princess hidden in humility. When we read Philippians 2 as though God, who ha- or Christ, who had equality with God, put on the robes of a servant, but he was really still divinity hidden in that, that's a bad reading of this hymn. If you don't get anything else out of this morning, Jesus is not Jasmine. Uh, you can write that in your notes. What Paul celebrates is this. In becoming the slave, Jesus demonstrated himself in the very nature of God. The reason he gets the name above every name is not because he humbled himself for a while, but then he got to go back to woohoo, exaltation. But in the very act of incarnate humility, he embodied the very nature of his Father God, who keeps revealing himself to the outsider, to the exile, to the left out ones. That's where God is found. And so it shouldn't surprise us that a humble carpenter who rides into town on a donkey, that's where God's presence dwells. And we all overlook it. But it's incarnational humility. The very nature of Christ is the incarn- incarnate, humiliated one. Humble one. And this week we'll, we'll celebrate again and again. Suffering redemption. That, that Jesus does not respond to us, to our sin and violence with violence in response. But we celebrate this week because Christ is committed to overcoming evil with good. The cross reminds us he loves not just his neighbors, but he loves his enemies as well. He is the embodiment of covenantal love, incarnate humility, redemptive suffering. So all that to say, us, who are we? I think the church today, and I've I've been with some leaders in the evangelical church the last few days. I think the church today, especially those of us who are Christians in in this culture, we have a huge identity crisis. We don't really know who we are. We know we used to be more in charge than we are now. It's kind of frustrating. We kind of like to get the glory back, right? Oh, for the good old days when David was king, when God ruled. I would argue, and I'll get myself in trouble, but I'm out of time, so just let me quickly say, I I would argue that when we look back on those days, some of those were glory days, and a lot of them were just days of idolatry, called days of glory. But in a time of, of identity crisis, Can I say to us this morning, I am convinced our identity will be found in the prophet, in Israel, and in Christ. In ways of covenantal love. The more we become a people who will not give up on each other or give up on the world, the more we will know who we are. The more we become the embodiment of incarnational humility, people who do not seek to be up, but who are always looking for ways to be the servant of others, we'll know who we are. And the more we figure out what it means to be redemptive sufferers in the world, and that's hard. We don't do that well. I don't do that well. But I'm convinced that our identity will be found in the prophet, in God's people, but most of all in Jesus. That's why when Paul gives us that hymn, he starts this way. Let the same mind be in you. Don't miss that verse. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. 
Because as we discover his life, we will discover the life that he has had for his people from the very beginning. We'll discover who we are. Father, help us this morning. Um, I, I pray today that you would make us a people who know who we are. A people who who know what covenantal love looks like, a people who embody the holiness found in covenantal love. Give us the ears to hear, the, the words to speak life into people. I pray you would make us the embodiment of incarnational humility. This week, as we gather together on Monday, Thursday, remind us that our call is to wrap a towel around our waist and wash each other's feet and to break bread and share a table, not just with those that we love and are easy to do that with, but we, we gather around the table with deniers and betrayers and and yet you're teaching us somehow how to love one another. And I especially pray this week as we walk through Holy Week together that you will, you will remind us of the irony of the symbol that our identifying mark is, is an instrument of execution. Teach us what it means to find ourselves in redemptive suffering, redemptive love. Make us your disciples. Teach us to pray as you taught disciples to pray. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. In Christ alone our hope is found. alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this southern ground, burned in the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when struggles Hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me 
from his hand till he returns and calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his If you've listened well this morning, um, one of the things that's true about about a sense of vocation is that oftentimes we feel like it's something that we got caught in rather than that we chose. So I I find that my greatest moments of identity come when I feel like I've been captured by God's story and, and I'm doing something I, I, I do because like the prophet says, I was born for this stuff, right? You love when, you're, when life's like that, when you're connected to the stuff you were just born for. But what the prophet and Israel and Jesus was convinced was that their very creative purpose from God was to be an instrument of covenant love in the world. To be the incarnate form of God's humility. And to participate in his work of redemptive suffering love in the world. So if you've listened well, the more you feel like you've been stuck in that, caught in that, captured by that, that God has grabbed you and he just won't let you go. The more we as his people feel caught up in that, the more we'll discover who he has created us to be. That's why this benediction is for us today. And now may the God of peace himself, may he capture us, grab us, renew us, redeem us, sanctify us through and through. And may our whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless until he has redeemed it all until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and he who called us and captured us. He is faithful and he will finish his work in us and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in his peace.
Pray. 